Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have a terrific show today, a rare reading from Mina Loy's The Lost Lunar Baedeker Poems. Mina Loy was born in 1882 in London and died in 1966 in Aspen, Colorado. She was a futurist, feminist, modernist. I quote this from Poetry Foundation. Mina Loy's poetry of 1914 to 1919 is distinguished by typographical fragmentations and collage structures learned from Apollinaire, Futurism, and Cubism, a distinctive abstract concrete diction that looks back to Jules Laforgue and forward to surrealism and an unsentimental application of Whitmanesque sexual honesty to female experience. Loy's enduring theme is the necessity of honest vision as the eye, eye probes the shifting images of reality for self-realization. Ezra Pound was one of Loy's strongest and most loyal champions. In his review of the 1917 Others Anthology, Little Review, March 1918, he characterized her poetry as logopoeia, or poetry that is akin to nothing but language, which is a dance of the intelligence among words and ideas and modification of ideas and characters. <laughs> Loy's poetry provides a map to the dreams offered up to the deity of love and imagination. And it is not mere coincidence that lunar and lunatic share the same root. End of quote. Mina Loy was a storied, fascinating figure, a poet who rebelled against the traditional poetry of her time, an experimenter of language a poet we study and learn from today, a hundred years after she was an original member of the modernist movement in literature. The magnificent readers in order of appearance are Ruthie Elliott, Corinne Conley, Dixie Walker. Here's Ruthie Elliott. There is no life or death only activity, and in the absolute is no declivity. There is no love or lust, only propensity. Who would possess is a non-entity. There is no first or last, only equality. And who would rule joins the majority. There is no space or time, only intensity. And tame things have no immensity. Parturition. I am the center of a circle of pain, exceeding its boundaries in every direction. The business of the bland sun has no affair with me. In my congested cosmos of agony, from which there is no escape, on infinitely prolonged nerve vibrations or in contraction to the pinpoint nucleus of being. Locate an irritation without, it is within. Within, it is without the, de the, the sensitized area is identical with the extensity of intention. I am the false quantity in the harmony of physiological potentiality to which gaining self-control, I should be consonant in tone. Pain is no stronger than the resisting force pain calls up in me. The struggle is equal. The open window is full of a voice, a fashionable portrait painter 
running upstairs to a woman's apartment, sings, all the girls are tiddly diddly, all the girls are nice, whether they wear their hair in curls or at the back of the thoughts to which I permit crystallization, the conception, brute. Why? The irresponsibility of the male leaves woman her superior inferiority, inferiority. He is running upstairs. I am climbing a distorted mountain of agony. Incidentally, with the exhaustion of control, I reach the summit and gradually subside into anticipation of repose, which never comes, for another mountain is growing up, which, goaded by the unavoidable, I must traverse, traversing myself. Something in the delirium of night hours confuses while intensifying sensibility, blurring spatial contours, so aiding illusion of the circumscribed, that the gurgling of a crucified wild beast comes from so far away, and the foam on the stretched muscles of a mouth is no part of myself. There is a climax in sensibility when pain surpasses itself, becomes exotic. And the ego succeeds in unifying the positive and negative poles of sensation, uniting the opposing and resisting forces in lascivious revelation. Relaxation, negation of myself as a unit, vacuum interlude. I should have been emptied of life, giving life for consciousness in crises, races, through the subliminal deposits of evolutionary processes, have I not somewhere scrutinized a dead white feathered moth laying eggs? A moment being realization can, vitalized by cosmic initiation, furnish an adequate apology for the objective agglomeration of activities of a life, life, a leap with nature into the essence of unpredicted maternity. Against my thigh, touch of infinitesimal motion, scarcely perceptible, undulation, warmth, moisture, stir of incipient life, precipitating into me the contents of the universe. Mother, I am identical with infinite maternity, indivisible, acutely, I am absorbed into the what is ever shall be of cosmic repro reproductivity, rises from the subconscious, impressions of a cat with blind kittens, among her legs, some undulating life stir. I am that cat. Rises from the subconscious. Impressions of small animal carcass covered with blue bottles. Epicurean. And through the insects, waves that some, that same undulation of living. Death. Life. I am knowing all about unfolding. The next morning, each woman of the people, tiptoeing the red pile of the carpet, doing hushed service, each woman of the people, wearing a halo, a ludicrous little halo, of which she is sublimely unaware. I once heard in a church, Man and woman, God made them, thank God. Human Cylinders. 
The human cylinders revolving in the enervating dust of that wraps each closer in the mystery of singularity. Among the litter of a sunless afternoon, having eaten without tasting, talked without communion, and at least two of us loved of very little without seeking to know if our two miseries in the lucid rush together of automatons could form one opulent well-being. Simplifications of men in the enervating dusk. Your indistinctness serves me the core of the kernel of you when in the frenzied reaching out of intellect to intellect, leaning brow to brow, communicative over the abyss of the potential, concordance of respiration, shames, absence of corresponding between the verbal sensory and reciprocity of conception and expression where each extrudes beyond the tangible, one thin pale trail of speculation from among us we have sent out into the enervating dusk. One little whining beast whose longing is to slink back to antediluvian burrow and one elastic tentacle of intuition to quiver among the stars. The impartiality of the absolute routes the polemic. Or which of us would not, receiving the Holy Ghost, catch it and caging, lose it? Or in the problematic, destroy the universe with a solution? Ignorance. Shut it up. Sing silence. To destiny, give half a crown. To a magician, half a glance. To window eclipse. And count the glooms of your day's bargaining lying in the lining of your pocket while compromising between the perpendicular and horizontal. Some other tram leans against the night nursery of trams. Puffs of black night quiver the neck of the clown of fortune, dribble out of his trouser ends. In dust to dust, till cock kingdom crow, till cock kingdom come crow, you can hear the heart beating a coupling of the masculine and feminine, universal principles, mating, and the martyrdom of mourning. Caged with the love of houseflies, the avidity of youth and incommensuration, day spring bursting on repetition. My friend the sun, you have probably met before or breakfasting on rain, you hurry to interpolate the overgrowth of vegetation with a walking stick, or smear a friend with a greasy residue. From boiling your soul down, you can walk to Empyrean together under the same oil silk umbrella. I must have you count stars for me out of their numeral excess. Please keep the brightest for the last. Lion's Jaws. Oh, far away on the benign peninsula, that automatic fancier of lyrical birds, Danriel Gabrunzio, with melodious magnolia, perfumes his knees on sin where important neurotics wince at the dusk. The National Archangel loved several countesses in a bath full of tuberoses, 
soothed by the orchestra at the Hotel Majestic Paris. The sobbing from the psychopathic wards of his abandoned harem purveys amusement in high life. The comet conqueror showers upon continental libraries, translated stars, accusations of the alcove, where with a pomaded complacence, he trims the Coco liaisons, a tooth tattoo of an Elvira into a Mariah's flesh. And every noon, bare virgins riding alabaster donkeys received Danriel Gabronzio from the Adriatic in a golden bath towel signed with the zodiac in pink chenille. Defiance of old idolatries inspires new schools. Danriel Cabrunzio's compatriots concoct new courtships to intrigue the myriad flesh mistress of the celebrated. The antique envious thunder of Latin literatures rivaling Gabronzio's satiety bursts in a manifesto notifying women's wombs of man's immediate agamogenesis. Insurance of his spiritual integrity against the carnivorous courtesan. Manifesto of the flabbergast movement, hurled by the leader Ramonetti to crash upon the audacious lightning of Gabrunzio's fashions and lettery, and wheedle its inevitable way to the accepted woman's heart, her cautious pride exhorting betrayal of woman's wholesale to warrant her surrender with a sense of victory. Ramonetti cracked the whip of the circus master, astride a prismatic locomotive ramping the tottering platform of the arts, of which this conjuring commercial traveler imported some novelties from Paris in his pocket, souvenirs for his disciples to flaunt at his dynamic carnival. The erudite, the erudite Bappini, experimenting in auto-hypnotic godhead on a mountain, rolls off as Ramonetti's plastic velocity explodes his crust of library dust, and hurrying, threatening nakedness to a vermilion ambush in flabbergasticism. He kisses Ramonetti full on his oratory in the arena, rather fancying himself in the awesome proportions of an eclectic mother-in-law to a raw menage. Thus academically chaperoned, the flabbergasts blaze from obscurity to deny their creed in cozy corners to every feminine opportunity. And Ramonetti, anxious to get a move on this beating Gabronzio business, possesses the women of two generations, except a few who jump the train at the next station. While the competitive Bappini publishes a pretty comment involving woman in the plumber's art and advertises his ugliness as an excellent aphrodisiac. Shall maneuvers in a new manner pass unremarked? These amusing men discover in their mail duplicate petitions to be the lurid mother of their flabbergast child from Nima Leo, alias Anim Yo, alias Imna Oli. Secret Service buffoon to the woman's cause. While flabbergastism boils over and Ram and Bap avoid each other's sounds, 
this duplex conquest claims a sort of success for the De Brunzio resistors. Envoy. Ramonetti gets short sentences for obstructing public thoroughfares. Bacchini is popular in Vanity Fair. As for Imna Oli, I agree with Mrs. Quar standing hail. She is not quite a lady. Riding the sunset, Danvio Gabrunzio corrects the lewd precocity of Ramonetti and Bacchini with his sonorous violation of Fiume and drops his eye into the fatal lap of Italy. The Dead We have flowed out of ourselves, beginning on the outside that shrivelable skin where you leave off of infinite elastic, walking the ceiling, our eyelashes polish stars. Curled close in the youngest corpuscle of a descendant, we spit up our passions in our grand dams. Fixing the extension of your reactions, our shadow lengthens in your fear. You are so old, born in our immortality, stuck fast as life in one impalpable, omniprevalent dimension. We are turned inside out. Your cities lie digesting in our stomachs. Street lights footle in our ocular darkness, having swallowed your irate hungers, satisfied before bread breaking, to your dissolution we splinter into holes, stirring the remorses of your tomorrow among the refuse of your unborn centuries. In our busy ashpins stink the melodies of your so easily reducible adolescences. Our tissue is of that which escapes you. Birth breaths and orgasms, the shattering tremor of the static, the far shore of an instant, the unsurpassable openness of the circle, ledger domain of God. Only in the segregated angles of lunatic asylums do those who have strained to exceeding themselves break on our edgeless contours. The mouth echoes of what has exuded to our companionship is horrible to the ear of the half that is left inside them. Mexican Desert. The belching ghost wail of the locomotive trailing her rattling wooden tail into the jazz band sunset. The mountains in a row set pinnacles of ferocious isolation under the alien hot heaven. Vegetable cripples of drought thrust up the parching appeal cracking open the earth, stump-fingered cacti and hunchback palm trees belabor the cinders of twilight. Ho! Oh. A lyric elixir of death embalms the spindle spirits of your hourglass loves on moon-spun nights, sets icicled canopy for corpses of poesy with roses and northern lights, where frozen nightingales in ilex isles sing burial rites. Apology of Genius Ostracized as we are with God, the watchers of the civilized waste 
reverse their signals in our track. Lepers of the moon, all magically diseased, we come among you, innocent of our luminous sores. Unknowing how perturbing lights our spirit on the passion of man, until you turn on us your smooth fool's faces like buttocks bared in aboriginal mockeries. We are the sacerdotal clowns who feed upon the wind and stars and pulverous pastures of poverty. Our wills are formed by curious disciplines beyond your laws. You may give birth to us or marry us. The chances of your flesh are not our destiny. The caress of the soul still shines, and we are unaware if you confuse such brief corrosion with possession. In the raw caverns of the increate, we forge the dusk of chaos to that imperious jewelry of the universe, the beautiful, while to your eyes a delicate crop of criminal mystic immortal stands to the censor's sight. Brancusi's Golden Bird. The toy become the aesthetic archetype, as if some patient peasant god had rubbed and rubbed the alpha and omega of form into a lump of metal, a naked orientation, unwinged, unplumed, the ultimate rhythm, has lopped the extremities of crest and claw from the nucleus of flight. The absolute act of art conformed to continent sculpture, bare as the brow of Osiris, this breast of revelation, an incandescent curve, licked by chromatic flames in labyrinths of reflections, this gong of polished hyper -esthesia. shrills with brass as the aggressive light strikes its significance. The immaculate conception of the inaudible bird occurs in gorgeous reticence. Lunar Bedecker. A silver Lucifer serves cocaine in cornucopia to some somnambulists of adolescent thighs draped in satirical draperies. Paris in livery prepare leaf for posthumous parvenues, delirious avenues lit with the chandelier souls of infusoria from Pharaoh's tombstones lead to mercurial doomsdays odious oasis in furrowed phosphorus, the eye-white skylight, white light district of lunar lusts. Stelectric signs, wing shows on starway, zodiac carousel. Cyclones of ecstatic dust, and ashes whirl, crusaders from hallucinatory citadels of shattered glass into evacuate craters. A flock of dreams browse on necropolis from the shores of oval oceans in the oxidized orient, onyx-eyed odalisks and ornithologists observe the flight of Eros obsolete, and immortality mildews in the museums of the moon. Nocturnal cyclops, crystal con concubine, 
pocked with personification, the fossil virgin of the skies waxes and wanes. Der Blind Jung, the dam Bellona littered her eyeless offspring, Kriegsoffer upon the pavements of Vienna, sparkling precipitate the spectral day involves the visionless obstacle. This slow blind face pushing its virginal, virginal non-entity against the light, pure po purposeless eremite of centripetal sentience upon the carnos horologue of the ego, the vibrant tendon index moves not since the black lightning desecrated the retinal altar. Void and extinct, this planet of the soul strains from the craving throat in static flight up slanting. A downy youth's snout nozzling the sun drowned in dumbfounded instinct. Listen, Illuminati of the colored earth, how this expressionless thing blows out damnation and concussive dark upon a mouth organ. The Starry Sky of Wyndham Lewis who raised these rocks of human mist, pyramidical survivors in the cyclorama of space, in the austere theater of the infinite, the ghosts of the stars perform the presence. Their celibate shadows fall upon the aged radiance of suns and moons. The nerves of heaven flinching from the antenna of the intellect, the rays that pierce the nocturnal heart, the airy eyes of angels, the sublime experiment in pointillism faded away, the celestial conservatories blooming with light are all blown out. Enviable immigrants into the pure dimension Immune, serene, devourers of the morning stars of Job. Jehovah's seven days err in your silent entrails of geometric chimeras. The nirvanic snows drift to sky-worn images. Marble. Greece has thrown white shadows sown their eyeballs with oblivion, a flock of stone, gods perched upon pedestals, a populace of athlete lilies of the galleries, scoop the facades of space with spiral curves of idle substance in the silence. A colonnade, Apollo haunts Apollo with the shade of a lost hand. Gertrude Stein, Curie of the laboratory of vocabulary, she crushed the tonnage of consciousness, congealed to phrases to extract a radium of the word. Letters of the unliving. The present implies presence, thus unauthorized by present. These letters are left authorless. The lost all origin since having inscribed, the inscribing hand lost light. The hoarseness of the past creaks from creased leaves covered with unwritten writing since death's erasure of the writer, of the lover. Well chosen and so ill relinquished, the husband heart's ease, acme of communion, 
who made euphorious our esoteric universe, ego's oasis in the soul companion. Erst my body and my reason you left in the drought of your dying, the longing and the lack when the racked creature shouted to an unanswering hiatus, reunite us. Till slyly, Sapporo's patience creeps up on passion, while the exhilarance of youth dwindles until out of season and agony ends in an equal grave with ecstasy. In uneasy mist rises from this calligraphy of recollection, your document, documented terror of dementia due to some merely earthly absence. This package of a go creaks with a horror echo out of void. The bloom of beloving decoy de to decay by the finger of hazard the swindler. The deathly handler left no post-mortem mask, only a callous earth made moldy your face, excelling Adonis. Posing the extreme enigma to my bewilderment, can whom has ceased to be ever have had existence? No longer any you as a dresser. There is, no, there is no addressing to dally with defunct reality. Can one who is still has being be inexistent? I am become dumb in answer to your dead language of amour. Diminuendo of life and posture implies no possible retrial by my so now wild self of my cloud corpse beshadowing your shroud. That I was with you inhumed in chasms, craters torn by atomic emotion among chaos. No creator reconstrues star tissue, scar tissue to shine as birth star. Only to my subcerebral surprise at that last blase sorrow dawns an iota of disgust for life's intemperance. As once you were, withhold your ghostly reference to the sweet once we were. Oh, leave me my final illiteracy of memory's languor, my preference to drift in lenient coma, an older Ophelia, on Lethe. An aged woman. The past has come apart, events are vaguing. The future is inexploitable. The present, pain. Not even pain has that precision with which it struck in youth time. More like moth eroding eternal organs, hanging or falling down in a spoiled closet. Does your mirror be W or is the impossible possible in senility, enabling the erstwhile, agile, narrow silhouette of self to hold in huge reserve this excessive incognito of a bulbous stranger, only to be exercised by death. Dilation has entirely eliminated your long reality. Aphorisms on futurism. Die in the past, live in the future. The velocity of velocities arrives in starting Impressing the material to derive its essence, matter becomes deformed, and form hurtling against itself is thrown beyond the synopsis of vision. The straight line and the circle are the parents of design. Form the basis of art. There is no limit to their coherent variability. Love the hideous in order to find the sublime core of it. Open your arms to the dilapidated to rehabilitate them. You prefer to observe the past on which your eyes are already opened, but the future is only dark from the outside. Leap into it and it explodes with light. Forget that you live in houses, that you may live in yourself. For the smallest people live in the greatest houses, but the smallest person potentially is as great as the universe. What can you know of expansion who limit yourselves to compromise? Hitherto, the great man has achieved greatness by keeping the people small. But in the future, by inspiring the people to expand to their fullest capacity, the great man proportionately must be tremendous, a god. 
Love of others is the appreciation of oneself. May your egoism be so gigantic that you comprise mankind in your self-sympathy. The future is limitless, the past a trail of insidious reactions. Life is only limited by our prejudices. Destroy them, and you cease to be at the mercy of yourself. Time is the dispersion of intensiveness. The futurist can live a thousand years in one poem. He can comprise every aesthetic principle in one line. The mind of a magician, bound by assimilations, let him loose, and the smallest idea conceived in freedom will suffice to negate the wisdom of all forefathers. Looking on the past, you arrive at yes, but before you can act upon it, you've already arrived at no. The futurist must lead from affirmation to affirmation, ignoring intermittent negations, must spring from stepping stone to stone of created explorations without slipping back into the turbid stream of accepted facts. There are no excrescences of the absolute to which man may pin his faith. Today is the crisis in consciousness. Consciousness cannot spontaneously accept or reject new forms as offered by creative genius. It is the new form, for however great a period of time it may remain a mere irritant, that molds consciousness to the necessary amplitude for holding it. Consciousness has no climax. Let the universe flow into your consciousness. There is no limit to its capacity, nothing that it shall not recreate. Unscrew your capability of absorption and grasp the elements of life whole. Misery is in the disintegration of joy, intellect of institution, intuition, acceptance of inspiration. Cease to build up your personality with the ejections of irrelevant minds. Not to be a cipher in your ambient, but to color your ambient with your preferences. Not to accept experience at its face value, but to readjust activity to the peculiarity of your will. These are the primary tentatives toward independence. Man is only a slave to his own mental lethargy. You cannot restrict the mind's capacity. Therefore, you stand not only in abject servitude to your perceptive conscious, but also to the mechanical reactions of the subconscious, that rubbish heap of race tradition. And believing yourself free, your least conception is colored by the pigment of a retrograde superstition. Here are the fellow lands of mental spatiality that futurism will clear. Making place for whatever you have, you're brave enough, beautiful enough, to draw out of the realized self. To your blushing, we shout the obscenities. We scream the blasphemies that you, being weak, whisper alone in the dark. They are empty except of your shame. And so these sounds shall dissolve back to their innate senselessness. Thus shall evolve the language of the future through derision of humanity as it appears to arrive a respect for man as he shall be, except the tremendous truth of futurism, leaving all those knickknacks. Beneficent Garland. To hang about the knees of the gods, the first fruits of the awful odds against which man tilled the soil, what then? These first fruits, I pray, swelling at night to ripen by day, such sorrow of their toil? Fruits of this mystery are born, the baby and the ear of corn, hunger and drawing breath. The labored season of the year, the rise and fall of love and fear, all leaping into death. See the angel carrying the swag of blossoms called the sweat and bag? He is man's guardian. But what use have the gods for such flowers of earth up in the sheeny bowers of heaven's meridian? Their smell is the joy of his nostril, breathing the essence of the gospel out in a narrow flame. For the gods supporting the million, miles of darkness round his pavilion, 
are lighted by that saint. That was a wonderful reading by you all. I know it was very challenging and difficult material. And, uh, you know, it's really devoid of emotion. It's just intellectual, uh, you know, almost scholarly and almost uh, psychedelic playing with language. You know, the way she builds uh, lines, images on, upon images. Uh, but let's just see. So thank you for thank you for your willingness to tackle her. I think it's you know, we're all, this is one of the rare uh, readings of her poetry, I'm sure, but uh, she deserves to be heard. She was a rebel, you know, before her were the Victorian poets and the Georgia poets, and uh, she was not um, into that at all, and she had a pretty storied life. But let's start with uh, Corinne and then, uh, or let's start with Ruthie and Corinne and then Dixie and just talk about whatever you'd like to talk about, about the poetry and the reading. Wow, thank you so much, Harriet, for picking her. I really like her. I think she she was kind of like uh, one of the visionaries of her day or something because she was so interested in higher consciousness versus just the earthly life. And every time, you know, everything she spoke about was like, she was half in this world and half in the other world. <laughs> so she couldn't really, you know, she was no way an earthbound spirit, you know. So very interesting. She was, I loved her. Well, she was cer certainly involved in, I would say, involved in the politics of the day and well beyond her time. I mean, we are beyond her time, but reading her, I still, she's beyond our time somehow. Uh, she is, uh, she, uh, well, of course, uh, very much an intellectual. And uh, she's also, she was also a painter. And uh, I, I saw on uh, YouTube, I, I, I saw a whole um, uh, a group of women, a, a little seminar on her painting, which was very much like them talking about her poetry. It, once again, it was uh, avant-garde and uh, intellectual, and um, uh, uh, they thought there should be a revival of her interest in her artwork, as well as her poetry. Uh, she, so she certainly is still reaching out to people today with her feminist manifesto and what have you. Uh, one thing that Dixie read, and oh, welcome Dixie to our group. I would say it was a difficult poet to start. <laughs> Great to introduction. Read, yes. uh, on your first uh, uh, poetry show. But I love what uh, uh, Dixie said about um, uh, Gertrude Stein, that she chose the radium of a word. I thought that was so perfect because you know how she just uh, just said, you know, there was no description or anything, just words, the radium of a word. So I really love that. Dixie? I agree with what everybody said. However, I found her that she had a lot of emotion, a lot of emotion that was anger and sorrow. And I don't think she ever got over her second husband's death. Well, he also, I believe, disappeared on her. Uh, she, a lot of what I'm reading there is, is I could never figure out if, if it was more depression or anger. Um, and yes, she's all those things you talked about, but somehow I read something different in some of that, that she had powerful emotions and she loved multisyllabic words to express a lot of them, but, uh, and put it together in a way that I don't know anybody else. I've never at least read anybody who puts it together the way she did, but yeah, she, uh, and strong opinions, uh, cause satire is on anybody who believed in Nirvana, her, uh, her whole thing about being against absolutes. Um, she thinks destroying the universe with a solution. I mean, in some of the things she did, but, Underlying all that intellect, I found a deep, whether I couldn't figure out if it was all anger or just depression, but a lot of sorrow. It, you know, I that love, would be my take up. 
that's very perceptive. I, lo I love the uh, ending of Ignoramus that Ruthie read, quote, I must have you count stars for me out of their numeral excess. Please keep the brightest for the last. And, uh, you know, in terms of what Dixie said, you know, that you, you go from um, that, that po uh, first poem that, Ruthie read parturition, if that's if I'm pronouncing it right, where she gives birth to her children, but she's also giving birth to herself. And uh, obviously it's struggle for a woman at that time. And she was a futurist and then she quit that because it was too masculine, too masculine. But then she goes from some of those early poems, some agony even at times. And then at the end, as, as uh, Corinne pointed out, that poem to Gertrude Stein, and, and then she had a poem to Brancusi and the Wyndham Lewis, you know, the shining words for these great artists. And, but her poetry really does set you on edge. I guess what I was talking about in terms of emotion is, you know, we've read the poetry of Russian women poets and Spanish, and they're just filled with emotion, their everyday emotion. Obviously, she has some very strong feelings about uh, the differences between the sexes. And uh, she had four children, two of them died. And uh, she was, uh, she was, well received by some of the great literary people, Pound among others in that time. And then, you know, at the end of the century, uh, I think there was hardly any anthology, anthologies that included her. And yet somehow, you know, the people who love her help keep her alive. But um, what else would you like to add to what's been said, Ruthie? Well, I, I really uh, feel that she had uh, a lot of emotion, like uh, like Dixie said, um, and and be. I mean, I don't think any any life is devoid of uh, a pain or sorrow, um, but also also love and struggle. And uh, I remember reading somewhere once that uh, if you want to meet somebody who's either very funny or very loving, meet somebody who's suffered. <laughs> Uh, and, and I'm sure she had, I'm sure she had her her share of suffering, and uh, so. Uh, but she was so smart, as Dixie pointed out. She was just so erudite that she couldn't help but be way above the crowd, you know, and above the clouds, um, in her intellect and her ability to communicate what most people can't understand in words, you know. But she certainly tried, and she she reached for the you know heavens that way so i think she was trying to reach above her suffering through intellectually rising above it you know Corinne, anything you would like to add well i, I was just it's interesting to uh to hear the the, the dixie and uh, ruthie talk about her because um i have found her so intellect just her uh her um, vocabulary, uh, I found her so intellectually advanced <laughs> or, uh, that I, um, I, I found it hard to find, to get to the emotion behind what she was saying. Yeah. But obviously she got to them and they, uh, she reached them, they saw that. Yeah. I thought it was amazing that she, at her time, she seems like such a nouveau feminist of the moment now in reading it, in reading her stuff. I just think reading Letters of the Unliving is where I got a lot of how deeply she uh, was hurt, missed, loved the husband. Uh, I mean, he had walked out on her, but she loved him and he died. Um, and she had left her kids for a long time. She was a woman of way beyond her time. I agree. I just, uh, and perhaps that and the, uh, the aged woman, those two, because I read them, I just felt more emotion than in some of the other poems we heard, which were all pretty much intellectual. I love the one about Poe. That would be me, though. Well, I think, too, she didn't use the I, you know, like the confessional poets, you know, I did this, I suffered, I was there. She really, as Ruthie pointed out, elevated herself into the language, you know. Yes. And, uh, you know, when uh, Dixie read that poem on futurism, you know, 
those uh, aphorisms. You know, she was very clear laying things out. And uh, so obviously she's a very bright woman. And, uh, you know, I'm just so thankful for all of you. I know, and I want to thank Ruthie too for stepping in at the last minute. You know, our, our uh, you know, we, we wish the best for Kay Wiseman who couldn't be here today, but we, you know, we, we do it. You know, whatever comes down, we do it. And for me, doing the poetry show, whatever we go through personally, you know, it, this is a place where we, you know, similar to what Ruthie was talking about, we elevate ourselves and get into the words of a, you know, another poet and lose ourselves in that and and try to make the be best sense of it and, and create harmony and listen to one another. And to me, that's always a very, uh, you know, very valuable to me. You know, this hour is very sac sacred to me. And so I just so thankful to all of you. And I just want to make an announcement about next Tuesday, because of the 4th of July weekend, or the 4th of July, that week there will be no uh, Tuesday poetry reading, but the next show will be on Tuesday, July 9th with two terrific poets, Joe Safty and Diane Sousa. Joe is, uh, lives in Oregon and Diane Sousa lives in Central California. She is a surfer and she writes about that among many other things, but uh, thank you all. You all did just such a beautiful job. I'm so thankful and I, I just appreciate you so much. I can never tell you how much, but thank you. And here's Jennifer Clymer. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Harry. And thank you all for making this such a wonderful hour. Um, I don't know that we were able to get to this. One of the audience members had a question. Hmm. Is that okay if I, if I put that to everybody, Harry? Yes, absolutely. Great. Uh, Peter Cook had written and wanted to know how many of you are poets in your own right. Hmm. How many well, I've written poetry and had a couple of published, so. I don't know if that that means I'm a poet. That counts. Okay. I can consider songs poetry, and I've written quite a few. Absolutely, that counts. Corinne, I know uh, you not since college, Not since college when I used to think I wrote some witty little couplets, but uh, I really can't say I've, uh, I've written poetry. Okay. Wonderful. Well, Peter, thank you for tuning in. And uh, once again, Harry, thank you for providing us with this incredible sacred space. We all very much appreciate it. We will see you in two weeks. Enjoy your 4th of July, guys. <laughs>